Thank you, Bill, and thanks to both you and Jenny for the invitation to come and share some of our research with your group today. I know I don't need to spend a lot of time on the introduction today. We all know that too much nitrogen is bad for Chesapeake Bay, and we need to cut those inputs of nitrogen to promote its restoration. Riparian buffers can help to achieve that. Uh, they're a very popular management practice. But I want to focus mainly on the last point on this slide, that we haven't really measured the whole watershed benefits of riparian buffers. Most of the evidence that we have that riparian buffers take up nutrients are from studies at what I call the transect scale. This is true for all nutrients and also for nitrate, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today. Nitrate is the dominant form of nitrogen that is lost from disturbed areas like croplands and developed land. It's also fairly easy to measure and it provides a good indicator of the total nitrogen loss from a watershed. This is an example of one of the transect studies that I'm talking about. Uh, this one was done at CERC and the work focused on these two yellow lines, transects that extended from the agricultural field down to the stream. And there was a very intensive effort in these very small areas to withdraw groundwater from wells and measure the concentration of nitrogen in those wells and look for changes in concentration as water moved down these transects. So the focus was on a very small fraction of the watershed. There have been a lot of other studies that have taken the same approach. This is a summary that was prepared for the Chesapeake Bay program in the 1990s. And it pulled together information from a lot of coastal plain transect studies. And they're all looking at how nitrogen concentration changes as you move uh, from a field towards a stream, as shown by this arrow. And all of them are documenting strong decreases in nitrogen concentration as water moves through the riparian buffer along these shallow flow paths. The results from these studies have motivated a strong effort to restore riparian buffers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This is one of the great success stories in uh, trying to implement management practices. Uh, this is showing the percentage of restoration that was achieved starting in 1996 when tracking began. And it's a case where there was an original goal set to reach this level by 2010, and that was actually reached much earlier than projected. So they developed a new goal and worked hard towards reaching that goal. Uh, and, and this is great, but again, we haven't really documented the effects of these buffers at the whole watershed scale. Watersheds are very complex. They include lots of different land uses and the patterns in which those arrange can vary, be arranged vary from watershed to watershed. So we really need some kind of model to uh, sort out the effects of buffers at the whole watershed scale. Uh, two basic choices we have are to build some kind of simulation model or to look at some sort of statistical model. A simulation model is, is a great tool. It can help us account for the effects of buffers along with many other things that we want to consider. But in projecting the effects of buffer, it basically assumes that the transect results hold and then extrapolates those to the whole watershed scale. On the other hand, if we go with a statistical model, we can uh, keep the model simpler and much closer to the data we can fit it to stream nutrient data measured in water that's leaving watersheds. And in a more formal and statistically rigorous sense, we can test the hypothesis that buffers are important at the whole watershed scale. And a lot of people have attempted to do this with fairly simple statistical models. And the results of those efforts are mixed. Some people have shown or concluded that buffers were important, and other people have said, no, there's not much effect. One of the reasons why these results are so mixed is that the way that buffers are typically measured in these statistical models really don't work. They use what, what I call fixed-width measurements of buffer prevalence. So they look at 
say the zone that's within 100 feet of the stream and look at what's the percentage of forest in that zone. And the assumption is if the percentage of forest is high, then the watershed is well buffered. And if the percentage is low, then it's poorly buffered. But I've got two hypothetical watersheds here that illustrate the problems with that measurement. In these two hypothetical watersheds, the land use proportions are the same. We have the same amount of cropland shown in orange, which is the nutrient source system, the same amount of forest shown in green, which can be a sink if it's located in the riparian zone. And we also have another land use which is neutral. It's neither a source nor a sink for nutrients. In this watershed on the left, you can see that in the riparian zone between croplands and the stream, um, the stream is perfectly buffered. So we'd expect very low contributions of cropland nitrate to reach the watershed outlet. On the other hand, in the one at the left, which has identical land use proportions and an identical 50% of this near stream zone being buffered, you see that none of the streams downhill from the cropland are buffered. So we'd expect pretty much all of the nitrogen coming out of this cropland to appear at the watershed outlet. So the point here is that this metric isn't telling us what we want to know are the buffers in the right place to intercept the nutrients that are leaking out of the croplands. Another popular metric is to look at the percent of stream length that's buffered. And if you look at these for another second, you'll see that it suffers from exactly the same problem. It's not really telling us whether the buffers are positioned so that they can intercept the nutrients that are coming from the cropland. So we need, we need to retool. We've got these two ways that we've been thinking about buffers. They may be good for other purposes, but they're not what we want to use to think about the effects of buffer on water quality. So we need to take them out of our water quality toolbox. We tried to develop an improved geographic analysis to quantify buffer prevalence. And I'm going to walk you through that here. It's based on combining a number of pieces of geographic information. We start with information on topography, and that's shown here on the left with um, white areas being high in the landscape, dark areas are low in the landscape, and of course streams are located in those low points. We've overlaid uh, the source area, which is the cropland, and we can use this information to trace the flow paths that water would follow when it leaves cropland and moves toward the stream. And we can isolate those flow paths. So we've blacked out the rest of the landscape, which isn't necessarily important in this transport from sources to streams. And we can develop measurements that really focus on these important pathways. Once we've identified the pathways, we can add information on the prevalence of forests and wetlands and measure the width of riparian buffers along those pathways. And then we can aggregate that up across all of the pathways in a watershed and come up with a metric that describes riparian buffer prevalence in the whole watershed. The key points, again, are we're looking at the transport pathways that actually connect sources to sinks. So this is analogous to what we were doing with the field transect studies where we were following flow paths from fields to streams. We're only considering those pathways so we're not being distracted by information from other parts of the landscape that aren't involved in this source to sink transport. And again, we're uniting our field measurements with our, our watershed scale geographic analysis. Having developed that, we wanted to apply it to watersheds in the Chesapeake Bay. We used information that came from the CERC Chesapeake Bay Watershed Study. In, in this particular analysis, we used data from 321 watersheds. They were distributed in three physiographic provinces, shown in the different colors here. About 100 watersheds in each one of the provinces. They're mostly rural watersheds, although there are some more developed ones uh, down here in our coastal plain study areas. We measured water quality in the streams that were leaving these watersheds. Uh, the data that I used in the analysis today came from seasonal grab sampling that was conducted over a one to two year period. 
We're using today the average base flow nitrate concentration. And we know from previous work that this is a very strong indicator of total nitrogen discharge from, from a watershed. We analyzed spatial data with the geographic information system to implement the flow path analysis that I showed you a couple of slides ago. We used the national land cover data set, which represents the world with uh, 30 meter camera pixels. We used it to identify the locations of cropland and forest and wetland buffers in each of the watersheds and used standard USGS stream maps and digital elevation models. We developed the flow path metrics that I showed you earlier. One thing we learned, even though we went through a lot of trouble to measure the width of the riparian zones along all of the flow paths, we found that um, the width metrics, we really need finer resolution land cover data to resolve meaningful variations in width. But we also got out of our analysis a measurement of the buffer gaps in each of the study watersheds. So by looking at um, the prevalence of buffer gaps below croplands, we can separate cropland into cropland that's buffered and unbuffered, and we can uh, use that distinction in our statistical models. So this is what uh, the land cover looked like for our study watersheds. Uh, each one of these bars is again the average of about 100 study watersheds. You can see that the percentage of cropland in the study watersheds um, if we look at the unbuffered cropland shown in orange, was roughly the same in the three physiographic provinces. But in the coastal plain, we had an almost equal amount of unbuffered cropland to give us a total higher percentage of cropland there. About half the, was uh, buffered and half unbuffered. Had a smaller fraction of buffered cropland in the Piedmont and a much smaller one in the Appalachian Mountain study watersheds. We also developed an improved statistical analysis to go along with the new geographic analysis. I'm not going to belabor all of the de equations and statistical details. The main point I want to make is that we compared two specific models, one that was based only on land cover proportions, so we're predicting nitrate concentration from the proportion of cropland, and another model where we included the information on buffers that came out of our flow path analysis. So we're predicting nitrate from the proportion of total cropland and the proportion of cropland that was unbuffered. We calculated separate uh, coefficients for the three physiographic provinces because we knew from previous work that they performed differently. Both of these models explained about the same variability in the concentration of nitrate among the watersheds. Um, so you can't really judge whether one of them is better or not by looking at the, the R squared values. So we turn to information theory, which is a, a body of statistics that's more formally aimed at comparing models and, and resolving among models. And when we applied that, it tells us that the model that includes the buffer effects is 10,000 times more likely to be the correct representation of the system than the simpler model that did not include buffers. So that's a pretty overwhelming weight of scientific evidence. So we concluded that, that it shows that buffers are important in the landscape and we need to consider them when we're trying to understand whole watershed discharges. And we can proceed to interpret the model to try to uh, understand the relative contributions of buffered and unbuffered cropland. One of the things we can do is uh, use model parameters to estimate the source strength and buffer removal potential. That's shown in this slide. This is a graphical representation of the model parameters. Um, they have units of milligrams of nitrogen per liter and you could think of them as representing what would the stream nutrient concentration be if a watershed were, say, completely unbuffered cropland? What we're seeing is that um, the brown bars here are representing the rate of nutrient loss from croplands. Um, this would be both the edge of field loss from croplands, and in the case of unbuffered cropland, it would be what's actually delivered to the stream. 
And we can see that's about three times higher in the Piedmont watersheds than in the coastal plain watersheds. The blue bars are showing us what's coming out of the buffered croplands, which is lower than what's coming out of the unbuffered croplands. Uh, the differences between the bars is, is showing us what's removed in the buffers. And I've shown what the efficiencies are. If we look at it in a percentage way, we can see that about 95% of the nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen is being removed in the coastal plain buffers and only about 35% in the Piedmont. And there's a lot more that leaks through the buffers in the Piedmont than in the coastal plain. Interestingly, even though the efficiency is a lot lower here, the absolute change in concentration is a little bit higher. So there's still an opportunity to have a big effect on concentration here, even though the efficiency is lower. We can crank through the model to make predictions for a specific watershed, and we can use those predictions to estimate the sources, the current nitrate removal, and the maximum benefit we might get from restoration uh, for specific watersheds. And we can do that by using the model to run scenarios. We can, for each individual watershed, we can say, what would the output be if we took away all of the buffers? What, what do we expect with the buffers that are presently there? What will we get if we restored buffers and filled all of those gaps in the buffer beneath the croplands? And finally, what would it be if we took away all the cropland? And we can see a progression of increasing nutrients across those scenarios. And again, the differences are telling us, um, this difference is telling us what's the removal in current buffers. So let's take those differences, and they're shown in this slide. Um, so we're able to, the top of each bar is representing what the stream nutrient concentration would be if there were no buffers. And again, each bar is, is the average of about 100 study watersheds in a province. The pale green bar is showing us current buffer removal, which is highest in the coastal plain, a little bit smaller in the Piedmont, and very small in the Appalachian Mountains. The darker green bar is showing us what we might add by restoring all of those buffer gaps. Uh, it's uh, highest here in the Piedmont, uh, still pretty good in the coastal plain and, and still a lot of benefit to be achieved in the Appalachian Mountains. The orange bar is showing us for the cropland nitrate what's the part that would still leak through the buffers even if we restored all of the buffers. You can see that's pretty small in the coastal plain where the buffers are really efficient but we would get a lot leaking through the buffers in the Piedmont and the Appalachian Mountains and we need to do something else to address nitrogen pollution from non-point sources from cropland in those watersheds. If we summarize across all of these guys, all 321 study watersheds, uh, again the top of the bar here is showing us uh, what the stream nutrient levels, stream nitrate levels would be with no buffers. The buffers that are currently there are, are as absorbing about 16 percent of the nitrate that's coming out of the croplands. If we set a new baseline and look at what, what are the current stream nutrient levels, this aggregate body of study watersheds is saying that if we restored all of those buffer gaps, we could cut the current nutrient levels by another 32%. And that would be great, but we still have this remaining 68% that we'd have to address with some other management strategy. Buffers are not going to help us with that, that part of the load. Uh, I do want to give a few cautions here about interpreting these results. First of all, these results apply to fairly wide buffers that are detectable with this 30 meter land cover data. The method can and should be applied to finer resolution data, but we haven't done that yet. But in the meantime, you wouldn't want to take the efficiencies that we're reporting here and say apply them to a 10 meter wide buffer. Uh, that wouldn't be a legitimate extrapolation. Another point is that I talked about restoring all of the buffer gaps below croplands. That calculation assumes that those restored buffers would perform as well as the buffers that are currently in place. And that may not be true. Uh, so this restoration calculation should be viewed as kind of an upper limit. 
some other things that could be done with the techniques that we've developed. You could use the geographic analysis that we developed to look at places, to identify places where buffers are missing. Um, this particular example is actually shading the croplands in the watershed uh, and shading them according to their distance away from the stream where distance is measured by buffer width. So the green croplands are well buffered and the red ones are very poorly buffered. So such a map could help us decide maybe where buffer restorations need to be and also which croplands need the most attention for other management practices to cut nutrient loads. This kind of calculation has been embedded in a software toolbox uh, for ArcGIS that's been written by Matt Baker. And so anyone can get these calculations that we've used in this analysis today and apply them to their own watersheds. And this is available from the CCMP website. So let me summarize. We developed this new geographic analysis using flow path measures to quantify buffer prevalence. This allowed us to account for the source to stream connections through buffers and was a way to correctly scale up our knowledge from the field studies uh, to whole watersheds. With the statistical analysis, we demonstrated that buffer effects are significant at the whole watershed scale. So we've kind of closed that, that portion of our, our management loop. We quantified the loading rates from buffered and unbuffered cropland, and that allowed us to estimate the nutrient removal in current buffers, and also to come up with an upper limit for what the benefit of additional restorations might be. And we also documented differences in buffer removal among the provinces that could help us to target management practices. And as always, we need to have acknowledgement of our sponsors, um, EPA, NOAA, NSF, and uh, I'll end with this slide. If you'd like to know more, you can email me. Uh, the most recent work is in press for ecological applications, and there's a preprint that's publicly available. And again, the repairing analysis toolbox for ArcGIS is downloadable for the internet. So I'll stop there. Thank you all for coming and listening. <laughs>